This world is a little abnormal if you want to know what I see. And I think you're with me on that. And here I am, just as guilty as anyone, because I'm taking notice of the insanity around me. Can we please talk about something else? Something new? Well, Alan, you got the microphone. Okay. Okay. It's up to me. Did I say uncertain times? Well, I'm here before you to seek the Lord in these uncertain times. So I'm, I'm saying that. Let me ask a stupid question. When was it when you had certain times? Seriously, yeah, really, when you had certain times. You know, everything was on course just as you'd planned. Huh? Was it a few months ago when the country was all about impeaching the President of the United States of America? Well, that wasn't very normal. We don't see that every day. That was pretty wild. Was, was it normal or was it uh, a certain when Iran attacked a military base in Iraq last year? Well, you know, we, that dominated the news for a while. Come on, people. There's no such thing as normal. I just wanted to say it because we're all thinking it. There's no such thing as normal. I heard one Christian psychologist one time say, normal is a setting on a dryer. <laughs> That's what normal is. We're all waiting for the Lord to return. For the Christians to begin the new heavens and the new earth. And thank you, Richard. Your your meditation just came swept right in into that theme right there. Our normal is unfolding every day as we seek the mission and the will of Almighty God. That should be our normal. Think about that for a while. We seem to be waiting for somebody to tell us what's next. When we should be asking the Lord, what's next? What do you want me to do? What would, what would you like for me to do as a pastor, as a, as a fellow member of New Life Christian Church? I, I think what I'd like to do for you today is to tell you a story. I'd like to tell you an encouraging story uh, found in the book of Second Chronicles of all places. Is anybody here an expert on Second Chronicles? I mean, I know you've probably read it, but that thing is, you know, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Boy, they got story after story after story. And this one is about a king of Judah. By this time in history, the, the Jewish people are divided into the nation or the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel to the north. Two tribes in the south, ten tribes to the north. And there was a king in the middle of this reign of Judah called Uzziah, or Uzziah, however you'd like to pronounce it. I want you to pay particular attention to the verse 5 in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. I'm going to read it to you now, starting in verse 1. Then all, <clears throat> then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. Now, if you're trying to follow me on your on your phone or something. I am in Second Chronicles chapter 26, starting in verse 1. Normally we'd have it on a screen, but we don't have that now out here. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jecoliah, she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's verse 4. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. That's pretty good news, isn't it? Verse 5. I want you to pay particular attention to this. He sought God during the days of Zechariah the prophet, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, get this, God gave him success. I could probably stop there and just, you know, put a lot of comments together and wisdom and all that, but the story really gets thicker and juicier as we read down. This guy, Uzziah, he went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jabney, and Ashdod. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbaal and against the Mayunites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah 
and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he'd become very powerful. Listen, do I have a volunteer in the audience to read all these Hebrew words for me? Who's got the right pronunciation and all? If you're okay with it, I'll, I'll continue. Okay, because I'm, I'm stuttering. This is tough stuff, the Old Testament. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate end, and at the angle of the wall, and he fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug many cisterns because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain. He had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Uzziah had a well-trained army ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers as mustered by Jehiel, the secretary, and Messiah, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. The total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. Under the command was an army of 307,500 men trained for war, a powerful force to support the king against his enemies. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, sling stones for the entire army. <coughs> in Jerusalem, he made devices invented for use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that the sh soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. His fame spread far and wide. For he was greatly helped. Let me say that again. He was greatly helped until he became powerful. But, oh, don't you love that word, but? Man, that word means everything's going to change. We had such a good story going on. But after Uzziah became powerful, what happened? His pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It's not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary. For you have been unfaithful and will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temper, temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. When Azariah the chief priest and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead, so they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. The other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Amos. Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in a cemetery that belonged to the kings. For people said he had leprosy. And Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. Well, this is a nice story, isn't it? I always love those stories of the Old Testament. They, they, they just have such great details, you know, bloodshed and power and just, you know, it, it, these are great stories. I find a couple things in the story that encourage me in my normal routine these days. And I use that word normal on purpose. The first thing that stands out to me about Uzziah is his integrity at such a young age. Here he's a teenage king on a, uh, taking on a kingdom with all the responsibilities and duties that a king would need to do. While others his age are still in school. I mean, they're going to football games and stuff. They're learning how to drive camels. Or, okay, I jest a little bit. But they're not doing what kings do. They're certainly not shackled down with a lot of responsibility and a lot of duties uh, that, that have to be done. Hey, this kid king did, did have ambition, though. He wants to do good stuff for his people. I like this kid. He's a, he's a good kid. This king is seeking help to do good for his people. He starts out his ambition in verse 5. It said, he sought God. 
during the days of Zechariah who instructed him in the fear of God. That's what it says in the NIV. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Listen, that word fear of the Lord also means, in other translations, vision of the Lord. You know, reverence, you've heard that to the fear of the Lord, reverence and, and that kind of thing. It's not really, oh, I'm shaking. But I tell you, if God showed up right here like he did for the Israelites, I would be shaking. I would be trembling. And everybody who even got into the presence of an angel shook and trembled in fear. You know, the, whoa, this is not normal. This is outside. This, this, is, uh, this is incredible. So he sought God. And as long as he sought God, God gave him success. Do you see that success is linked with the seeking of the Lord? They're, they're combined there. And do you see that Uzziah did not use his own vision for the people as a 16-year-old? I mean, come on, what experience does he have? He's never even gotten into an automobile wreck. Okay, I'm mixing metaphors, I get it. It's called extemporaneous, where I'm mixing things that happened in the past and things that happen now. But, but he's still, he's inexperienced, period, in life. So he needs some teaching, right? He needs somebody's vision. He needs to attach himself to a vision. And his, his daddy, who was king before him, had died. Much the similar way, as the story says, Uzziah died. Uh, Azariah did evil in the sight of the Lord at the end. And he was, he was taken. <clears throat> in the words of Jesus in the Garden of Eden, before his rest... He said it this way. He said, not my will, but yours be done. When is the last time you ended a prayer to the Lord with that? Because Jesus was praying. He did not want to feel the pain of death for something he had not done. I'm, I'm pretty confident. I'm very correct in that. And yet, he submitted his will, which was to stay alive, to his Father's will which was to sacrifice himself for all of mankind, for all of time. King Uzziah started his career as a politician. Oh, okay, he's a king, but he's still got a politician's heart. He's seeking the vision of the Lord above. Did you notice the result of his seeking when he got and what he got in return? He got success. And his success was conditional. Conditional mean if this than that. Without this, know that. That's conditional. You know what conditional is? As long as you do what you're supposed to do, the Lord gives success. That's what he was telling through the prophet to that King Uzziah. And success for King Uzziah was awesome. He conquered the neighboring Philistines and took cities from them. One of those cities was a seaport which is always important. If you're shipping things from overseas, you got to have a way to get them across land from the seaport. The Philistines were pagans. What does that mean? They worshipped another god. They didn't recognize Jehovah God. They didn't recognize uh, Jesus or the Holy Spirit. They didn't recognize anything to do with the beginning as Moses told it when they were there together in creation. And... The, 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 the pagan god, uh, Dagon, was their god. I was very interested in doing the study for this lesson and going deep into the, the gods. And uh, they just... Um, it, was, it was an awful thing to think of how pagan worship was next to the real god and his real people all the time back in those days. From the days... Of Samson and King Saul, these people, the Philistines, made life crazy for the Hebrews. What about you and I in 2020? What about right now? What, less, what lesson can we gain from this ancient king of Judah? He was smart. Some of you are smart too. He had responsibilities and duties. Some of you have responsibilities and duties. He was trying to get in he ahead in life by doing good for others and by others. I really like the verse in the story that tells of the king's love for the soil. I know people like that, that are, that are close to things that grow, uh, cro close to ranching, close to their food. Uh, you know, Publix is open now. I heard that announcement as, as getting back to normal. Just one little, one more, you know, going forward into the next 
the next few weeks and, and months and future that we have. And and Publix, you can get anything. If you want to have some steak, you go there. You don't have to have a little calf. You don't have to have a male and female, a bull and a cow, and mate them, and then have wait for that. That was it. Ten months, babe. Ten months, just a ten months, and then you get a little baby. And then you got to grow that little baby up to about a year. It's it's quite a long process. And uh, you know, you know, so you have to plan ahead if you're going to be people of the of the land, where you're growing grass and the grass feeds the cow. And then you've got the corn and stuff. You don't want to just have beef. You want to have some peas and corn and some fruit, some oranges and lemons. you got to plan ahead. I like that about this kid. He had a vision, and he was really good with people uh, who were all about nature. And in and, and this day and age, it was much an agricultural community anyway. But it seemed to motivate him to put people to work for him and construct wells to take care of the livestock and to water the, the, the groves or the the vineyards or whatever there may be. Some of you may not appreciate that farming stuff because you're so used to Publix having it, you know, it doesn't become a thing. And I know I'm talking to the choir when I say this. Uh, we, we have quite a farm, but we still, we go to Publix every week. Well, I don't think I could live without something like that. Um, and yet in this day and age, it was not like that. And so I really like that King Uzziah was, was uh, taking care of people that were trying to take care of themselves. Just last evening, my wife made hamburgers from our small herd of cows, and they were good. They were really good. We appreciate this story of a king who takes good care of his people. So with all of this good going on and all of the seeking the way of God for the kingdom of Judah, how did things get so messed up at the end of his life? How did things get messed up? This kid king seasoned in his office for 52 years. It's a long time. I'm not quite 52 years old yet. Oh, I'm not supposed to lie in church. That's right. I, I guess I'm a little over 52. Yeah, so I can, I can appreciate that somewhere along 52 and 16. Is that 68? I can identify with that. I can identify with that. And I, I, I'm not... Um, that's a long time. That's a long time to, to have the same life and, and, and duties and responsibilities. But it says we get normal... Then we get demanding. I guess we just human beings can't stand to keep being better and better and better. Every once in a while we get a little tired, we take a little rest, we sit on a chair and we go backwards. How many of you know you can't sit on a fence? It's not comfortable. You're either going forward or you're going backwards. You can't just sit on the fence and look at either one and go, yeah, I'll catch up to you in a little bit. Can't do that. Uzziah must have done that. You know, we get normal, we're going upward, upward, and then we get a little demanding. Hey, I have a right to that. Instead of seeking God in His ways, we begin to invent some new ways of our own that benefit us. Here's what verse 16 says. But after Uzziah became powerful, after the Lord gave him success, his pride led to his downfall. That's the story, folks, right there. Uzziah did great, started out great. But somewhere along the journey, he got tired. And he put it all down. He said, you know what? I have a right to this now. It's not like I don't have a right, but God, please show me your vision. And as long as it's in your vision, I'm going to have ambition for you. I'm going to go get it for you. At some point, he must have said, no, nah, it's my turn. Man, I need this lesson here. I don't know about you. I, I need this lesson. This lesson of Uzziah. Simply put, the king thought he had arrived at the stage of his life where he didn't need God so much anymore. I hate to say that, but it gets to be true to the, the parts of our lives as human beings where we just, we're doing okay, we're doing okay, and hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop here. This is a great place. Uzziah wanted to do anything that made him more powerful. He wanted to do things his way in his vision instead of the Lord's way and the Lord's vision. I can certainly look at myself and see ways that I have let my own comfort and ambition cloud my walk with the Lord. And I think if you're honest, you probably could take an introspective look in your own life and say, you know, I think I can do better too. What is this thing, pride? And why is it so destructive to our soul? I want to give you a few quotes from the Bible. And see if anything settles in and gives you some insight. Proverbs 16, 18. Probably the most widely used and, and mis, mis, uh, 
uh, quoted, by the way, too. It says, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Have you ever heard somebody, yeah, pride goeth before the fall. I don't know if that's a King James thing or what. But in Proverbs 16, 18, it says, pride goes before destruction, which is way worse than a fall. <laughs> pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Psalm 10, 4 says this. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. See how pride gets in there? We squeeze God out and pride comes in and takes the place of God's vision. Becomes our vision. Or the vision of some strong person who has taken and not heeded the call of God. In Proverbs 8.13, the Bible says this, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. You know, one of the things that stands out here is if you say you hate anything, you're liable to get caught up by somebody who doesn't like hate speech. And normally they're doing something that the Bible is against when that's used. Are you with me there? You, you're thinking that's right? That's my observation. They're normally doing something that no, I don't have to say I hate it. God said he hates it. You going to call God a hater? I'm not. I'm not getting in the way of that. But they can call me a hater for qu for quoting God, right? Now, what does it mean? You know, it, it, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Well, I hate the devil. Am I a hater now? No, because everybody's supposed to hate the devil, right? The devil is the is the one who's got all this evil going in the first place. He's the one that deceived the the couple, the first uh, man and woman made by God, put them in the garden, a perfect place. And, and he deceived them so that they would do against the will of God. They would do evil. I hate pride and arrogance, says the, 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 the doer of the, the proverb. Evil behavior and perverse speech. If you think you're above the sin of pride, then you may be headed for rough waters yourself. There, there is something called denial, folks. And denial is powerful. That's when we look at ourselves and say, nah, not so bad. Yeah, we look at ourselves in the mirror and go, ah, oh, you're a handsome fellow there. Some of you are going to say, you're lying, Alan. <laughs> looking in the mirror and saying, you're a good looking thing. I don't do that. I, I look at what I can fix, what I can repair. Sometimes I let, I let it go. Evil behavior and perverse speech. There's one that gets us. Hating Perverse speech. The way of the cross leads home, folks. The world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up above the azure blue. The angels beckon me in this one thing I know, that I can't be at home in this world anymore. I can't be at home in this world anymore. This world is deteriorating. Everybody knows it everybody's saying it. So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to save myself for the home that is made for me. I'm going to keep my hope based on Him who has gone before me to prepare a mansion for me in a place of glory. King Uzziah did such wonderful things in the honor of the Almighty until... He thought he didn't need to consider what God wanted for him. You and I must always seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Listen, I get it that this sounds so familiar that it loses its meaning almost. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that we crave, that we want to put our uh, hope in and, and, and uh, ambition in, will be added to us. How? When we seek first the kingdom, not seek first the bounty of this world, which at best is not very good. If he would just give us a glimpse of what we're going to, this would all look like rotten eggs. It doesn't matter what the virus or economic collapse or disaster that wants our attention. Folks, God 
is over it all. And he's over us too. I, I give you that lesson today. It's, it's a lesson for me. If you can handle the lesson for yourself, then it's a lesson for you today. But there was a real king of Judah who suffered a real nasty death because he lost his way. He first found his way and then he lost his way. We don't want to lose our way. We want to stay focused on the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and not worry about the other stuff so much. Lesson's yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here today. Thank you for the story that you have contained for us in Second Chronicles. Thank you that we can look at the life from a, a third party perspective of King Uzziah, such a young buck with such ambition, such promise for his life. And what a life, what a life you gave him, Lord. And I'm so glad that he was working hard for you and taking care of business. He was loving on people. He was taking care of things to make sure they had stuff to eat and had homes to live in and protection for the country that they were in. What a good king he was. God, I'm, I'm so sorry to read and to learn that even good people in your kingdom can lose their focus, can get up on that fence, that pinnacle, that high mountain that they find themselves on and have nowhere to go but in their own selves, in their own minds. Help us, Lord, never to get prideful or puffed up. Keep us humble, Lord, not to be a doormat for those that are lesser than us, but God, always to be humble and to put you first. You are the great one, not us. We serve you, not the other way around. You are the potter, we are the clay. So we ask you, Lord, to mold us and make us. You know what, God, You know, at this point, I, I know you need to forgive me. You need to forgive all, all those that would ask forgiveness at this point. To, to know that maybe we've been soft about things we should have been a little harder about. Maybe maybe we've not put you as first in our life as we are able to. And God, if we are, if we are doing really good things and, and really trying hard, God, give us the strength to go even further. Give us the strength to see uh, ahead of us and to put your vision as our vision. You are so mighty and so capable and so willing to lead us, help us to follow you everywhere you go, no matter what. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.